thank you very much and thank you for coming out on such a nice uh, sunny day. I understand the weather hasn't been this great for, uh, for a while here. And um, uh, it's great to be here after having had several meetings that we've had over the years to share experiences between uh, the UK and, and New Zealand. I still want to know how we can get a project like the one over there on wine growing practices going <laughs> <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start off, I'm afraid, with a little bit of an apology. I'm, I'm actually going to be talking uh, about history in the UK. I'm not going to be showing any exciting pictures of new technology or any great buildings. I'm going to be making a plea for some boring science uh, alongside exciting science um, and uh, a shift from sort of isolated academic research to integrated action-based research. Uh, and in particular, making sure that social science and engineering research gets uh, much better integrated than it has. And also uh, a significant improvement in skills of people who are uh, ultimately going to be doing the energy efficiency interventions into the built stock that I'm going to be talking about. So, uh, does this work? So it doesn't get fully we'll just click. Uh, it's not on, oh, no, I think. Oh, That's okay. it. Uh, Oh, has, it, has it got the little? Uh, uh, oh, actually, I think I did that manually just by clicking. Mm -hmm. but, oh, so. there's a little chat who comes out here. Ah, I need to oh, go there. That needs to go over here. Right, just give it a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, yes, before I get started, people often ask me uh, what do I do, and it's normally my wife or my daughter that asks me what I spend all my time doing. Uh, the answer, I'm afraid, is uh, very little, except for talking about what other people do. Um, and these are some of the colleagues whose work I'm going to be presenting, and uh, who all of my work is, is totally dependent on. Uh, as was explained, um, we run one of uh, six end-use energy demand centres in the UK. Ours is focused around energy epidemiology, the sort of engineering perspective of uh, that domain is very much uh, demonstrated by the Sankey diagram, which I'm just going to talk a little bit about. Uh, the traditional approach is that you have all of the fossil fuels and uh, renewables and uranium as the main energy that comes in. Um, that results in energy delivered to buildings, to transport systems, uh, and uh, ultimately some of that turns into uh, useful energy and some of that ultimately is used in the form of um, uh, heating, uh, thermal comfort cleaning and, and entertainment. And very much our uh, sort of result measure is very much about how we could reduce this amount of delivered energy to our buildings that are often metered while uh, either keeping the services the same or more. And uh, historically in the UK, we've not had a lot of um, uh, research which has used real data. A lot of it has been quite theoretical research. And uh, we noticed that that was a problem and whenever we did compare theory with practice, <laughs> um, we got results like this. So this is our, um, our energy rating scheme, uh, which all new houses and all houses sold, that are existing houses, uh, have to go through is uh, what's called the SAP rating system, and that predicts the energy costs in pounds per annum. Uh, and uh, on the vertical axis here is actually the, the measured or monitored uh, energy consumption from meters. And we discovered that uh, in the UK, the government actually had access to everybody, every individual uh, gas and electricity meter data for the whole of the UK. Um, but nobody was really making any use of that uh, data. And, uh, and then that data on its own would not be of great use unless you can link it to some data about the buildings that meters are in and the people that are in the buildings. That the meters are in and uh, fortunately uh, different government departments have some information about the build every single building in the UK and uh, we also have some information about the people that are in those buildings from things like the census and we also have uh, a database in the UK uh, 
which uh, has the, the address of every property that has received a government grant or um, advice on energy efficiency and what has been provided in terms of increased insulation or whatever, or a new boiler in each of those properties. And so by combining all of that data, we suddenly realized that there were all sorts of opportunities to do uh, research of the type that uh, the health uh, population, uh, health researchers um, actually were doing and which they called epidemiology. Um, and epidemiology just means the study of what is upon the population. It doesn't explicitly talk about health, so we thought we would try and take the term back from medics who are very good at hijacking absolutely everything. <laughs> Half of UCL <laughs> is run by medics, and uh, you, think, <laughs> you think it was 90% some of the time. <laughs> um, the, other, the other interesting thing is that we, um, uh, John Snow, who was one of the founders of epidemiology and used it uh, to identify the spread of cholera, uh, had links to uh, UCL where I, I come from. Uh, and the, the, the last piece of, of quite interesting information is that when John Snow did his work on cholera and how it spread, uh, he published it in The Builder, which uh, interestingly in those days, in 1855, was an illustrated weekly magazine for the architect, engineer, archaeologist, construction, sanitary reformer, and art lover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if we think that multidisciplinary research is new, uh, we are kidding ourselves. Um, uh, and uh, if you have time, I would definitely recommend this book. It is such an easy, fantastic read, uh, which tells the history of his, uh, his work. And uh, it, it's, it's very insightful in a whole sense, a set of ways. So this is my, and I hope there's no uh, people from the health profession here because they will be shocked and horrified about my simplistic approach to, to health um, in terms of uh, sort of, there's an analogy between sort of physiology, psychology and epidemiology in the energy and buildings area. So physiology is the type of research that historically we have done in energy and buildings. And it has been really trying to understand the thermodynamics of energy flows within the building. From the health perspective, it's more about the biology, chemistry, and physics of how the human body works. Um, and so the analogies are that uh, sort of you have energy and building science, you have behavioral science, but then you also have energy epidemiology, which is really looking at what's happening in the population. And like all analogies, they fall down if you push them too far, but um, what we felt was that there had been too much emphasis in, in sort of trying to understand what's happening in a building um, in a laboratory situation very often, and not enough in terms of looking at the whole population and what was going on in the population. And just like you might look at uh, a pill being tested in the laboratory on somebody, you can look at uh, you know, a more efficient boiler being tested uh, in a laboratory and getting a certain type of performance. However, just like when you administer the pill to the population, some people might forget to take the pill, some people might take a thousand pills and kill themselves. With a boiler, you also get quite different um, things happening. Some people will have a boiler and suddenly decide that they want to heat their house to a much higher temperature than they have used before, and so actually you'll end up using a lot more energy. Um, other people may actually use the technology in a way which does significantly reduce their energy consumption. And, um, for organizations like governments, investors, energy utilities, they're not just interested in the individual building, they're interested in what is going to happen to the population of buildings. And so, uh, given that we actually started to have access to significant data sets on uh, the energy consumption, we thought we would steal back some of the methods that the medics have developed for analyzing data from health data and start to see whether we could also apply those methods. And that's how we ended up with this term management epidemiology. Uh, so what do we do? And we're not in any way saying that people weren't doing epidemiological types of work. People have done field trials in the past. Um, but what we were saying really was that we wanted more effort to go into that, understanding what was going on in the real world, uh, as well as 
the large effort that had previously gone into trying to understand theoretically what was happening. Um, and that involves field trials, collecting and linking data, understanding the uncertainties in data, um, and the synthesis of data from different sources, and then actually try to feed back the results of that into theory and laboratory uh, based work. Uh, so that's a very quick run through. I can say if people want to know any more, there's, there's more information on that in the published papers on energy epidemiology. What I now want to do is to sort of move over to explaining a little bit about uh, how energy uh, efficiency has played out in the residential sector in the UK over the last four decades. That we've been trying to do this to see whether there are any lessons that we can learn. Now, at this point, I could actually sit down and stop giving my presentation. Uh, because I'm going to have to move from talking about absolute facts to actually my own personal narrative of what I think has actually happened. Because, to be honest, we don't exactly know what has happened in the last four decades in terms of energy efficiency fulfillment. And that is quite a sad indictment, given that we have invested billions of pounds into energy efficiency in the residential sector of the UK over decades and to have not be able to very clearly understand what has been happening during that period I think is, is sad and I think you know we need to make sure that in the future we really do learn the lessons from what is actually happening out there in the, in the world and feed that in. The moment key data is just not being collected historically and I give you some examples of that. Much of the what I'm going to present is inferred or modelled and there are uh, almost no cases of replication in it. So just to finish the context, so I'm going to be talking predominantly about the residential sector uh, and that accounts for just over a quarter of uh, the UK's uh, energy demand uh, and of that quarter about 60 to 70 percent of it has been for space heating. In the UK. So we're still very much space heating dominated and um, uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is particularly about the energy used for heating our buildings. Uh, this is actually a government slide uh, for uh, talking about some of the policies that the UK uh, government has recently had. Uh, Green Deal, Renewable Heat Incentive, feed-in tariff, smart meters, uh, electric vehicle policies that are being talked about. The reason for showing it is that um, I'm going to be talking about a scenario that, um, that somebody looked at in the 70s to try and sort of where, did the, where was the UK potentially going to go? And although they didn't talk about these particular policies, every single technology that is listed here uh, was talked about in the 70s. So there is no new technology. Uh, and in fact, electric vehicles were talked about in the 70s, uh, and there were demonstrations of, of those. So the thermal ground source heat pumps, biomass boilers, loft insulation, all of these things appeared in the scenario that I'm going to be referring to. So uh, I suppose a key lesson that you take out of this is that um, uh, if you're hoping that there's going to be some magic bullet that's going to uh, solve the technology problem in the next four decades, you're betting against the odds because we haven't had one uh, over the last four decades. Um, and you know our policies are still uh, talking about these. What happens is that the policy names get reinvented every four years as we have a new government because no government could possibly have the same policies as the last government. Uh, but in effect, they're still talking about the same technologies. I don't want you to go away thinking that the technologies haven't evolved. Heat pumps potentially could have got better. Uh, our insulation has got better. The technology, the individual technologies, but we are not talking about a completely new technology having come into the marketplace, and it's very unlikely, as I say, that it's over the next four decades. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a scenario which uh, was which came out in the 19, uh, in the late 1970s, and the reason uh, colleagues of mine have looked at all the scenarios, and there's about been about 20 scenarios that the UK has had over the decades. Uh, this is actually the scenario that for the whole of the UK uh, energy uh, consumption, not only domestic but industry and transport, uh, most closely uh, got it right, <coughs> i.e. Um, the scenario that it, it was predicting, which are these two green lines, and the black is actually what happened. 
Uh, interestingly, the scenario that had been created before this was the official government scenario, uh, which suggested there would be a massive rise in, uh, in energy demands and energy consumption. And the reason being that pre this scenario, every scenario had basically been one driven by an economic perspective of the world, i.e. that energy demand was directly linked to growth in the economy, and that if the economy would grow, then energy consumption. This was the first scenario that actually tried to separate growth um, in the economy from energy consumption by in installing more energy efficient technologies to enable that to happen. And that's very much what has happened. We have decoupled growth uh, in the economy from energy use in, in, in the UK, and many other countries have also done that. Uh, this time they were talking about an astronomical increase in energy uh, demand, which was going to be met by a massive nuclear power program, which never took off. Uh, where actually they would have built 10 times the number of nuclear power stations in the UK, which ultimately we ended up building. And when people were looking at this, they were actually saying that if we went out and built that number of nuclear power stations, we would actually cause an energy crisis in our own right, because the embodied energy to build a nuclear power station is very significant. And it takes at least a decade before a nuclear power station actually starts generating anything useful. So you actually create a mini energy crisis if you invest in building massive amounts of very large infrastructure, which doesn't deliver any useful energy for a significant period of time. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, the scenario. Um, now, so what I've, the, the other advantage of looking at really old scenarios is that they didn't used to have very fancy computers in the 70s. And so it's actually quite a simple scenario where all the assumptions that were done are pretty explicit. And so you can actually go back and actually see what people were assuming and, and fully unpick it. Um, and uh, the scenario was that by now we would have a 50% reduction in uh, domestic delivered energy. And I'm going to now look at what actually happened uh, compared to what, um, what we think might happen. But before I do that, I just want to just remind you that, that what we're talking about is mostly the delivered energy and the useful energy that we're getting out of the services. And there is also a bigger number, which is the primary energy, and there's waste in power stations that we use there. Um, and there's another number which is much smaller than the useful energy, and that's actually the used energy. So it's, it's possible to generate useful heat in a building, but if nobody's in there, then you're not using it. We have very little idea about what this number is at all. Um, and yet I think that there is great potential in the future for things to change. So in the early, in the early days of the 70s, people were really interested in trying to particularly um, uh, reduce the amount of primary energy. Uh, in the 70s, there was an oil crisis and everybody was concerned about security of energy supply. And so trying to reduce the primary energy and get more of uh, the uh, useful energy. Then uh, we became in the 1990s uh, much more interested in carbon emissions and so we focused on fossil fuels that were emitting the carbon and tried to reduce our use of that to get more uh, energy. Uh, and I would argue we're now transitioning to a, to a sort of third reason why we're looking at energy efficiency which is that even in the UK and it's far more applicable here uh, you have much more decarbonised energy supply than we do in the UK, but for the first time more than 50% of our electricity was generated from uh, decarbonised sources, nuclear and renewables, which is a major change. And you know we're moving along that trajectory quite quickly um, to decarbonise that supply. But what you then have is a challenge with trying to minimise the amount of renewables and nuclear you have to build, and that challenge is much more about power and less about energy. Because the issue with these technologies is not the total amount of energy that you use, because once you've built them, they're almost free to run. They're not using any fuels at all. Um, uh, but all the cost goes into the capital cost of building these things. So it's all to do with the peak power consumption and how much capital you need to invest in, in those technologies. So there's much more of a move to power in a decarbonized power system. And I think we really do need to start focusing on um, uh, you know, actually how much is 
is actually used of, of the energy. And I think um, sort of uh, the um, uh, improvements in information technology and the Internet of Things will enable us to do that in a way that historically has been much more challenging to, uh, to understand. So what we're trying to achieve with energy efficiency has changed over time, I believe, and uh, is something that um, uh, will uh, carry on evolving, I'm sure, in countries in slightly different ways. Uh, so what I'm now going to talk about is actually how much delivered energy we have and how much useful energy. And uh, in a very crude way, the delivered energy is the useful energy divided by the efficiency. And I'm going to be looking at all three of those things, uh, how they've changed historically. So this is how our delivered energy in the residential sector has changed. And I've normalized it for 1975 um, and looked at just how it, how it changes as a percentage compared to 1975. And this is what our uh, national statistics uh, suggest has happened. So actually, uh, our um, uh, delivered energy now is roughly the same amount that we had in 1975. What Leach had hoped would happen is that it would have halved by now. And uh, I want to try and just talk you through what might have happened over that time and why various things happened. So, as I mentioned earlier on, the delivered energy should be a function of how much service we demand. And the service, as I mentioned earlier on, in the UK is quite heavily driven by the service for heat. Um, and the efficiency of our fabric and services. And so Leach predicted that uh, we would increase our service. He was fully cognizant of the fact that our temperatures were smaller and that we had population trends, which would mean we would need more buildings. Um, but he significantly underestimated actually the increase in service. And the increase in service has gone up to almost a factor of three compared to where it was in the 1970s. And I'll unpick that in a minute. Uh, and in terms of efficiency, Leach had assumed that by now we would be three times more efficient. And in fact, we're only about twice as efficient as we, as we have turned out. So looking at efficiency, first of all, so this is the, the fact that um, uh, we've only gone twice instead of uh, three times the efficiency. The efficiency is made up of the efficiency of the fabric and the efficiency of our heating services. And so this is the absolute efficiency of our heating systems and how we think they have changed historically. So in the 1970s, our uh, heating systems were very inefficient. About half of the energy we put into them uh, never ended up as, as heat inside the building. Uh, and Leach had predicted by now that we would be more than 100% efficient. Now you might ask, well, how the hell can you get more than 100% efficient? Well, heat pumps enable you to become more than 100% efficient, as does district heating. And he had anticipated that by now in the UK, we would have had, uh, had a much, much more significant uptake of uh, heat pumps and district heating. And you know, if you look at the main drivers for government policy, we'll come on to that at the end. That is exactly what we're now trying to do. <laughs> Where we failed over the last few decades, um, we're trying to tackle that problem. Uh, and so, and instead, what we ended up doing was sticking mostly to gas boilers, and gas boilers can't really get much more than 100% efficient unless you have a simple gas heat pump. Uh, and so we've, we've sort of only recently started to make some significant improvements in that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, in terms of dwelling heat loss, then uh, Leach actually had assumed that our buildings are worse than we actually subsequently think they are, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, uh, but actually had assumed that we would get to the efficiencies roughly uh, that we have got to. And that's because we've now almost saturated uh, cavity fill, um, putting loft insulation, boiler insulation, and um, double glazing uh, in the UK. Almost all of our homes have that. Uh, so, yeah, one of the explanations as to why um, uh, Leach assumed higher values, and in fact, we have generally uh, assumed higher values, is explained in this diagram, which actually looks at the measured and modeled predicted energy consumption for houses that have been built at different times. So this is the actual age in which the house was built and constructed. 
And it's all been normalized to a value of an energy consumption of one in the 1970s, because that's when we started to introduce thermal building regulations in the UK. And you would have expected the energy consumption to drop. And the red is what we have expected our building stock to have done, uh, depending on its age. Uh, with an older building using 40% more than a, a 1960s building and a new building using 20% less than a 1960s building. Uh, the blue is what we actually think from data from uh, 50,000 homes in some cases. Uh, this is using the metered data that we have got. And there's clearly uh, older properties seem to be doing better than we thought, and newer properties seem to be doing worse. And so we've been spending quite a bit of time trying to understand what is the causes of that. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to fully explain it. Um, but uh, one of the reasons is that our older properties are mostly solid wall construction. A third of our building stock has nothing but solid brick walls with no insulation in them. And we had assumed that all of our calculations and policy work was based on the assumption that the amount of heat that was lost to a solid brick wall was 2.1 watts for every square meter of brick wall when there's a one degree temperature difference across that wall. And we call that a U value. You use, I think, one over a U value, which is the R value. Um, unfortunately, on this slide, I haven't converted the U values to R values. Um, but when um, the government decided to go and measure the U value of solid brick walls, they found that it was actually 1.3. And the government was about to start a massive program to uh, insulate these solid brick walls. And it would have been a billion pound program if we had gone ahead. Uh, and bring them down to a U value of 0.4, so significantly reduce them. But the government thought that they were reducing them from a value of 2.1 to 0.4, whereas in fact they were only reducing them from 1.3 to 0.4, which meant that you would get roughly half the energy saving and therefore twice the payback period. So the investment wasn't as good. Now, this was the first time I've ever known economists in our government department running around saying, uh, the word U value, um, and uh, in particular, pointing their finger at people like myself, building physicists, and scientists, and saying, What the hell have you been doing for the last four decades that you don't know the most basic of numbers, which is how much heat is lost through a solid brick wall? Now, there's a long story behind that as to how we got that number so wrong. It includes the Great Fire of London. It includes the brick tax. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, it, it is down to the fact that it is almost impossible, or was almost impossible in the UK, to get any funding to do anything as boring as measuring the heat loss of a solid brick wall. Because somebody else had measured the heat loss of a modern wall in a laboratory before, and therefore you weren't considered to be doing new science or any innovation. And all of our funding generally goes towards things that are highly innovative. So despite the fact that this potential number uh, has a massive impact on a, what would have been a billion pound program, we didn't really have some sound evidence to support it. And this is my plea for boring science. Uh, I personally don't think this is boring, but um, uh, lots of people think that measuring brick walls is boring. <laughs> um, uh, as a consequence of us doing this work, we've now managed to find ways of measuring the heat loss through a solid brick wall, which only takes a day rather than um, mm. uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, so we've done some sort of innovation there now. I'm going to skip this, um, I'm afraid. Uh, but then to carry on just saying, Increasingly, we have evidence that things are just not happening in the real world in the way that we conceptualize them and see them happening. And that happens in a range of different ways. I mean, not only do we not understand what solid brick walls were doing, um, but we, uh, you know, this is loft insulation in a brand new house. It's supposed to have 300 millimeters of this in the loft. It only had 150 millimeters. Um, uh, we, we measured the heat loss. Uh, the calculated one was 0.3. The, the value used in the standard calculation was 0.35, but actually it was worse than that, it was 0.45. So again, uh, we measured the total heat loss of a building, um, a, a building areas or um, colleagues in, in the University of Stanford Brook, and they found that actually 
uh, the measure of heat loss was twice what the predicted uh, of man was. And then when we looked at various government funded initiatives where they were providing new boilers, loft insulation boilers, and cavity wall insulation boilers, the actual savings were significantly different from what was modeled theoretically. Now, uh, the great things about models is that they always give you the right answer for policymakers. So uh, policymakers love you to run uh, theoretical models for them, uh, and they really don't like people talking about this type of answer because of course it always is always challenging uh, for policymakers. But we believe there is a real missed opportunity in not getting the technology installed and implemented correctly in a way. Um, uh, and that very often if we can close this performance gap, which is often an order of magnitude, then actually you will have much more significant uh, energy savings than we're currently getting with some of the technologies. And those savings are much greater than the likely evolution of the technologies in the lab. So many of the technologies that we're now talking about are reaching quite close to their theoretical performance in the lab. Only, you know, small one or two percent. Where here we're talking about potentially an order of magnitude improvement that could happen if some of these technologies were installed in a way um, uh, that uh, would improve their performance. Now, not wishing to be completely depressing, I thought I'd better have at least a good news story as well from the UK. Um, we did have regulations come into force which insisted that every new building would have a condensing boiler. Uh, condensing boilers are a relatively simple technology. It's been around and common on the mainland in Europe since the, uh, since the 1980s. Uh, it's a no-brainer when you do a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and um, but it just never took off in the UK. People are generally interested in technologies uh, which do the same thing, but just simply save or save some energy. So ultimately, uh, the UK regulated this. Uh, so this is the number of houses, and we've got 23 million houses at the moment. Uh, this is the total number. This is the number that have gas uh, heating systems, gas boilers. Uh, we introduced the regulations in 2006. Uh, had we not introduced the regulations, the uptake would have been very, very small and would have probably followed this trajectory. Instead, as a result of the regulations, uh, in fact, now we're, we're up somewhere up here in terms of the number of installed boilers. And the signal of this intervention can actually be picked up in the national energy consumption data. So it's having a significant impact. And the CO2 savings as the area under this graph uh, to calculated and uh, are, are very significant. So had we delayed the, in the introduction of this regulation by and introduced through different periods of time, we would have saved less CO2 emissions. Uh, and the consequence of that is, is that our efficiency of boilers has now risen and is starting to plateau because we are almost saturating the market in energy <coughs> boilers. Now, boilers are quite interesting in the UK. Well, I think they're quite interesting. It's boring, like solid brick walls, I'm afraid. Um, but they've moved from this sort of technology, where you had a floor standing boiler and a hot water tank, to basically being one of these devices. Um, and in some senses, uh, they're much, much smaller, uh, which is great, and people love them for that. Um, and these boilers don't have a hot water tank. And yet, for our energy system, this is the potentially the greatest amount of energy storage we have had. And we have just ripped out all of our energy storage in the UK, just at the time when we're moving to large renewables, uh, where storage is critical. And so actually, you know, had we had a regulation to uh, insist that people retained their stores, uh, we would have probably done the most sensible thing. But going back from this to this is going to be challenging because space is such a premium in UK houses. Our houses are much, I think, are much smaller than in, in New Zealand. I might be wrong. They're certainly a lot smaller than they are in Australia, where they're massive. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the floor space is worth £4,400. Uh, so you're not going to get people going back to this easily without real uh, hard work. Okay. So now moving on to the service, why the service has increased so much more than Beach had assumed. 
So the service is mostly made up of three things. The temperature we maintain inside our buildings, the number of dwellings and the floor area of, of our dwellings. And this shows you how those things have changed over time. And we really don't know how our internal temperatures have changed uh, over uh, time. This is a sort of inferred prediction of how things have changed. We've had a few spot measurements historically, particularly in the 70s, and now we have much better logging of internal temperatures over 24 hour periods. And the important thing here is that here I'm talking about what the mean temperature is, and mean by mean, I mean mean in time 24 7, and mean in space, so the average for the whole uh, building. Where we have measured, we've often just measured in the living room possibly in one of the bedrooms and possibly in the corridor. Uh, but those three spaces are only three spaces out of 10. So they probably only tell you about what 30% of the energy is being used for. Unless, of course, you make the assumption that the other 70% is heated to exactly the same temperature as the three where you're monitoring. And there's quite a lot of evidence that that ha hasn't been happening and certainly wasn't the case historically. Uh, but so our best predictions is we've moved from temperatures of sort of 12 degrees up to temperatures of 18 degrees over this period of time. Uh, when we look at living rooms, the evidence is that living rooms, when they've been occupied, have actually not changed very much over time. When people occupied living rooms historically, they did heat them or attempted to heat them up to 18 degrees centigrade. Uh, Bigger change in, in bedrooms and in the whole house, we think uh, a much bigger change. Again. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, how this change has happened in, in a minute. Oops. Um, if we go to uh, the next thing, which is the number of dwellings, uh, then Leach had assumed, so Leach had assumed here that houses were warmer than, than they actually were. Um, Leach assumed that there would be a rise in the number of buildings, and he did this up from a bottom-up calculation. He believed that we had to have um, uh, at least two people living in a building in order for the population to carry on rising. <laughs> <laughs> but what has happened that he hadn't uh, predicted was that uh, we have a much more aging population, and the aging population means there are more people alone. But also, uh, the population uh, has, uh, uh, well, one of the biggest challenges we've had is that um, we find it actually very difficult to live with each other. Um, divorce rates have gone up and people are separated, and then we have more houses as well as a result of that. So it's those two factors. Um, we have tried to persuade the, uh, the government department of energy and, and to invest all of its money into marriage counselling, <laughs> uh, but they haven't quite understood the argument yet uh, about that. Um, floor area has also risen, not because we've been building lots of new bigger houses. We have been building some new bigger houses, but we've also been building some smaller apartments. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, I was going to talk about, yeah, uh, it's interesting that, um, let me come back to that, it's in the wrong order at the moment. Um, the main reason for our houses expanding has been we have built extensions onto them, we love our conservatories, which in the old days just used to be buffer spaces that people would move into and out of in spring and autumn, but increasingly as we got double glazing and put bits of insulation in the small walls, uh, we can live in them all year round and um, uh, use that extra space. Uh, but these are still, compared to the main fabric of the building, losing a lot of heat. The uh, heat loss per square meter of glass, even if it's double glazed, will be uh, an order of magnitude greater than um, uh, solid brick walls. Uh, so uh, if you build one of these onto a new house, which people do do, then you can double its energy consumption. Uh, if you heat it to the same high temperature as the rest of the house, in some cases people do do that not always. Uh, so we now have three and a half million, or no, four million uh, conservatories uh, on to, attached to our two, uh, 20, 23 million uh, dwellings. Uh, we then have man caves and other sort of uh, uh, extensions that we like to build. 
So uh, just coming back to the internal temperature, what are the main reasons why we've had this increase in internal temperature? Well, interestingly, our external temperature has been generally rising, could be because of climate change, debates about that, but uh, on average, our um, temperatures have risen from an external of about six and a half to uh, close to uh, eight and a half. So you would expect internal temperatures to rise as well, associated with that. Um, also, as you insulate buildings, and if you insulate them, you move this way on this axis, then the internal temperature rises also uh, because buildings cool down less quickly if they're well insulated. Uh, but the main reason why our temperatures have changed is because we now use central heating. So whereas we used to heat just one or a few rooms, uh, we now uh, almost heat the whole house most of the time. Uh, and that has a, a big impact on the mean internal temperature. And then lastly, uh, are the, price, the impacts of fuel price. And the orange here is, is gas and electricity prices, how in real terms they have changed over time. And particularly since 2000, they have been rocketing. And now electricity and gas prices are the highest they have ever been over the last four decades. Okay. And that has had a measurable impact uh, and uh, is partly to explain for the potential reduction there in internal temperatures. Um, so just to go back to here, uh, central heating. We all think of central heating as being great, but actually there was quite a backlash when it was first being introduced. People thought that it could be unhealthy. Uh, and this was George Orwell and uh, saying that the survival of the family's institution may be more dependent on it than we realized because people weren't all in one room together. Uh, I have actually uh, been tempted to uh, plot uh, divorce rates against uh, the uptake of central heating <laughs> <laughs> to see whether actually you might well have been right <laughs> in an ironic way. Um, and I couldn't, I just came across this while I was uh, uh, Googling uh, this and I just thought it was so pertinent for today's world, unfortunately. Um, so uh, yeah, internal temperatures, uh, these are our measured internal temperatures, normalized to a five degrees um, external uh, temperature. And uh, the interesting thing is that um, uh, our temperatures are significantly higher than yours are actually. I understand that there's quite a lot of potential improvements. Uh, so here you have quite a few people living at temperatures of five to 10 degrees, whereas this is, actually at a cold period and we had very few people at five to ten degrees. So, so I just to sort of summarize um, some of the observations from history, I believe uh, UK buildings and energy efficiency sector can and have moved at glacial slow paces. And that's quite difficult and I can't see it changing very rapidly. It does take time for these things to be for the uptake of these things. It's really challenging for policymakers. Policymakers want to have a real impact very quickly uh, when they come in, but that's actually challenging in this sector. There's been little historic concern about systematic actual performance, um, instead of lots of theory, as I mentioned. Any energy efficiency problem is mostly going to be fixed over the next 30 years by the same technologies we now have. Um, I think there is an exception in terms of controls and monitoring systems and smart meters and things. Many new systems that we're now talking about, um, uh, by new systems I mean here, Old systems but haven't been implemented, like heat pumps, are much more complex um, and require massive skill implications. Uh, it is bizarre that there are lots of things that have a big impact on energy, which we really know nothing or very little about. There's been very little actual ventilation rate measurements, and ventilation is responsible for 30% of their buildings heat loss very often. And yet, although we might pressure test them, that doesn't actually tell you how the ventilation will change uh, when people are actually in the building. We didn't even know the size of our domestic properties. I mean, that does sound quite bizarre, but um, historically we've not been measuring them. Uh, the percentage of floor area that is actually heated in a home has not been uh, measured historically, and we're only just about to do the first study that will measure temperatures in all of the rooms in the UK houses. And we really know very little about how much of it is actually never used, i.e. there wasn't anybody around to actually make use of that energy. So coming to the future, what are we trying to do in the future? Well, that's historically what we've been doing. And in order to meet our carbon budgets, we should have to carry along uh, this trajectory rather than this, which is where we would go if we did nothing um, and didn't take any policy action. 
Now, given the change that we've had over the last decade, this carrying on this change shouldn't be impossible. We're not asking us to do things that are impossible. But they are going to be challenging because this has largely been achieved through fuel price rises, which we say we don't want anymore, and particularly through the implication of implementation of condensed boilers, which uh, we've saturated the market for. So we're going to have to go and move away from the low hanging fruit to the high hanging fruit, which we now call coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> so the challenges facing the future is the law of diminishing returns, many technologies are reaching laboratory performance, uh, the coconut in, in uptake. Uh, so our fifth carbon budget says we've got to have heat pumps and we've got to have a certain amount of solid water insulation, which are more challenging, more difficult to do. Uh, more complex and very often are more bulkier and have a lot of, uh, uh, sort of uh, more challenging things to try to do. We've got to improve the efficacy of a lot of our technologies that have been implemented. We've got to uh, actually uh, make sure we don't have any unintended consequences. And I know in Australia as well, there have been unintended consequences as well as in the UK very often. A uh, question about whether we've saturated in terms of thermal comfort. You know, we, we're getting up to that level of 18 or 19 degrees. Have we actually reached the saturation point? The elephant in our room is uh, whether we're going to go for more cooling. And there's a question about whether that's a good or a bad thing in the future. Some of our buildings are overheating and if the weather gets warmer. Uh, but does it really matter if we start to cool our homes? Uh, provide, uh, and I believe that it may well be that the, the only reason that will motivate people to use heat pumps is if those heat pumps can provide heating and cooling. Uh, and cooling isn't necessarily a bad thing, provided the peak energy consumption or the peak power consumption still happens in the heating period and not the cooling period. And our predictions and many other people's predictions are that that's not likely to happen uh, for many, many decades in the UK. Uh, existing markets prevent upstream benefits of energy efficiency being valued. So energy efficiency isn't really only good for health and for comfort and for the total energy consumption. In the future, it will help balance the energy system. And when you decarbonize and, and move over to renewables in the UK, we are not so lucky to have vast amounts of hydro storage that you have. Um, and insulating our, market, uh, insulating our buildings does provide a potential to uh, reduce the upstream costs of uh, energy supply. And at the moment, the market doesn't allow that to be valued. And uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in how that might change. The timescales are challenging for significant deployment. Historically, it's always taken 20 to 50 years. Um, so, uh, oh, just to say, uh, I'll skip that one. Um, opportunities, new IT can reduce the gap between useful and used energy. Upstream and other co-benefits when costed make coconuts more attractive. Uh, the, we've got quite a bit of experience of what doesn't work, as well as a few things about what does work. Uh, government industry and innovation agenda is moving much more towards this whole area, and we need to make sure that the research works with those sectors um, and that we utilize new research methods that can facilitate more rapid evaluation and feedback and think that there are possibilities for doing that. And uh, in terms of the research agenda, um, I think some of the things that we're, we're talking about, the research needs to be planned for the long game, because here this is the long game. And I know that's challenging for all research funders to, uh, to commit to a long-term understanding of what is happening to our energy use. Uh, doesn't, I'm not making a plea for more money. I'm just saying, let's, let's actually spend it and invest it strategically in a way which really enables us to get uh, to the bottom of things. Uh, in the real world, almost everything is socio-technical and multidisciplinary. Um, but the problem is also constrained by the laws of thermodynamics, uh, which is never wrong in a building, unlike the laws of economics, which can be wrong. Uh, good collaboration between academics, government, utilities and industry. I believe we need to move more towards action-based research and utilize the benefits of slow rollout of policies to actually go out and evaluate how those technologies are being implemented and learn the lessons and feed those back into the next wave of implementation and installation. At that point, I will finish by just sharing a few uh, pictures of how in the UK we have managed to think of new ways of having fun with energy. <laughs> so uh, the patio heater, skydiving, 
Um, uh, I live in Milk Keynes and we have a snow dome and we only have a snow dome because we have efficient refrigeration and an efficient uh, skin. That efficiency has enabled us to start skiing indoors. Uh, where Milton Keynes goes one year, Dubai goes the next year. And to celebrate the millennium, we decided to light the fourth railway bridge, which made it the largest man-made structure that could be seen from outer space at night time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now we have literally about five minutes for questions and discussion because unfortunately Taj is, is being grabbed by Radio New Zealand for an interview at five past one. Is that right? Yes. So um, not long, but if anybody would like to initiate a bit of a question or discussion, please go for it. Yeah. You didn't discuss clothes. Right, and yes. What people wear makes a difference. Yes, to what absolutely. Do, how they need to keep their houses. Absolutely. Having your clothes in the UK here. Yeah. The introduction of fine merino, I think, has made a huge, huge difference. Yeah. Uh, we have had a, um, we, we have monitored uh, comfort in homes uh, for and after refurbishments with some of these measures, particularly in your core homes. And uh, interestingly, there is some evidence that there is clothing take back associated with those improvements. So some people will actually take the benefits as benefits which enable them to wear less clothes than they had previously now that they're in a warmer environment. So it works both ways. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that there is whole issues to do with fashion, and with materials development, um, uh, you know, a lot of the sports materials these days are just technically absolutely fantastic, and you know, it would be possible to um, uh, to make people comfortable at slightly lower temperatures, and even small temperature differences can make quite a large impact on the engine design. So they're absolutely right. Have you taken into consideration the aging population, which is going to require more heat? Yes, I mean, uh, interestingly, a colleague that I was in um, uh, Wellington yesterday with from Wollongong has been doing some work on the impact of dementia of internal temperature. And uh, but in particular, uh, when people with dementia move from uh, one temperature to another, it can cause particular distress for people, um, which of course is potentially, if you're in iron second problems, that's what you, you end up doing. So I think there are all sorts of um, implications of, uh, of this. We do have quite a lot of data now about the sorts of temperatures that the elderly are living in compared to younger people, and there is a, 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 a slight statistical difference. Um, interestingly, in the UK, there's not as big a statistical difference in the internal temperatures that people maintain and the income level as self-reported income, um, which perhaps you would have expected. But in part, I think it is because when we've now measured homes in fuel poverty, uh, up until the recent price rises, then people were starting to eat reasonably, uh, they had to reasonably warm because they had had, you know, quite a significant amount of insulation. Tim, you look at the In your recent data about housing heat loss, uh, there was a study that showed that there was a spike. Yes, yeah, so that, was, that was when they discovered that actually there was something that they hadn't taken account of. It's not a real spike. I should have mentioned that. Um, do, you, do you remember what it was? Uh, it was something to do with the calculation of ventilation. I think that was probably the role of assumptions. In fact, Leach had uh, assumed much higher ventilation rates in his calculations than the male that it was the case. So, I mean, I haven't had the historical very lean, but Leach assumed it was very, very lean. One last question. Yeah. Um, have you considered any aspects of the national growth by actually being electricity to places for this? Uh, well, we have colleagues who are doing quite a lot of that. Um, I mean, we we build models of the UK housing stock and we build transit models of the UK housing stock to keep the carbon um, and for our profiles and change with different types of heating regimes and different types of heating systems. And then the impact of that has on the grid system. 
um, and also uh, got substation data to try and sort of ground these models. Uh, so there's lots of assumptions. We've also got um, in the UK, we hope by 2020 that every house will have a smart beta. Uh, we've been analysing uh, data from uh, various field trials and set of thousand smart beaters and being able to work out, in effect, the megawatts generated at different times of the day with different levels of insulation in buildings. Um, and in effect, that is one, one way of looking at insulation is that it generates megawatts. And nobody prior to this work that we have done had actually managed to produce a 24 hour profile to show what the impact of insulation was on the 24 hour profile. So, I wonder if you have had any results from the, um, the substation measurements as opposed to the smart measurements. Uh, we have. I'm not sure that, that any have actually been published, but I think certainly the uh, contact with colleagues who did that work on Barrett um, as uh, and see how um, he's been developing uh, sort of um, city wide models of construction uh, uh, and uh, on a quarter basis. Right, now I know we could keep going for half an hour, but unfortunately Radio New Zealand is a tired but far, far, far too soon. Um, so I'd just like to thank you very much for a fascinating talk and, and I think you open up a whole new way of thinking about energy analysis which, which is probably only in its infancy here in New Zealand and I, I think we can learn a lot from what you're talking about here and, and maybe think about developing research programs that, that are aligned with that. That would be really, really exciting. Yeah. And I apologise that this has been organised at this particular time, but in 15 minutes I will be free, so if anybody really has any burning questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, well I'd like to thank you very much.